study in our Sabbath school lesson this morning. We welcome our visitors. You came, you picked the right day to come and visit us. We have a follow -up. And you are welcome. Amen. Today is the third uh, Sabbath of our study of the book of Galatians. I like to locate through Bible maps where a particular geographical area is in relationship to what we're studying, or to what I'm studying. So I have taken the liberty of uh, printing two maps, one in color, one in black and white. I did the one in black and white because I wasn't sure that the area that we're studying would be clearly defined. So, I hope you don't think I'm discriminating, but I'm going to give the left side here the color map. <laughs> and you can pass it back. And this side over here, the black and white map. This map that I'm sharing with you includes Paul's third missionary journey. And uh, it has the area of Galatia in this one, highlighted in yellow. And uh, in my case, I like to know what's going on and where it was. This is a Bible map, okay? Uh, this particular map has just next to the Mediterranean Sea, the city of Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch in Scythia. Scythia spelled P-S-I-D-I-A. Not Syria, S-Y-R-I-A. There's two Antiochs. One is in Syria, and the other one is in Scythia. It is generally accepted that these four cities are the general area where Paul raised approximately half a dozen churches. Okay? So at least this gives you a visual of where all this happened. I have been asked by your pastor your first elder, and our two Sabbath school teachers to lead out in the study of the book of Galatians this quarter. So what I'm going to do is cover the book of Galatians exactly how God inspired the Apostle Paul to record the book of Galatians. Amen. And we're going to go word by word. Last week, we studied the first five verses of chapter one of Galatians. And uh, I spent a little time identify, identifying seven key words in the first five verses of Galatians chapter one. They're key words not because I say so, but because the Apostle Paul repeatedly uses these seven words throughout the book of Galatians and Two of those words, if you want to take the time, two of those words appear in the greeting of all of the Apostle Paul's letters to the Gentiles. You can read them for yourself. Within the first six verses, you will see the words grace and peace. It's a blessing to look them up. It's especially a blessing to understand what those words mean. By way of a brief review, let's identify those seven words and their meaning so that we can understand, and equally important, appreciate not only today's study, but as we go through the book 
of Galatians. The first word was apostle. And we learned that the word apostle means someone that is what? Sent. sent. Or he that is sent. And we verified that from John chapter 3 verse 34. The secular meaning today of the word apostle is ambassador. The authority, the credentials, and the confidence of an ambassador is directly in proportion to the authority, the power, of the one who sends that ambassador. And we establish that by looking at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. The second word that we looked at was grace. We learned that the biblical definition, and I make a point of that because I'm amazed at the number of definitions that I've heard of grace. It is just all over the place. So we looked at the biblical definition of the word grace, which means the divine influence upon the heart, and that's just half of it, and then what? It's reflection in the life of a person. The divine influence upon the human heart, and then reflecting that in the life of a person. <clears throat> and we establish that from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. The third word was peace. <clears throat> Again, we went to the concordance and we learned that peace means, I'm going to demonstrate it visually, set at one comma again. Set at one again. What happened when Adam and Eve chose to become self-dependent instead of God? Dependent? They broke that top. Jesus, by his birth, life, death, and resurrection, set us at one again. What does that mean? Well, we spent us. a little time. Linda? Restored us? Yes. We spent a little time looking at Romans 5, verses 10, 11, and 18, where we learn that Jesus has reconciled us back to God. What does that mean? Legally, legally, we now stand before God, as Adam and Eve did, before they sinned. Amen. Do you like that? Amen. Yes. You said that was Romans 5, 10, 11, and 18. Legally. Set at one again. The fourth word that we looked up was gave. Which can mean only one thing. Christ has paid the price for all of us. Because his word says, the soul that sins must what? Surely die. And we establish that from 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Delivered was the fifth word. And that means that if you and I understand, I'm not talking about have. Everyone that has a Bible has the Word of God. We're talking about understanding the Word of God. So, if you believe the inspired Word of God as it was written, then, according to our study, of the word delivered, you immediately experience, quote, the victory that has overcome the world. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Because that's all that God has ever asked us to do. There are no scriptures, all the New Testament, where God asks us to promise Him something. Nowhere. Why? 
Because no matter how sincere or how hard I may try, I'm not capable, right? The sixth word that we looked at was the will. W-I-L-L. -L. This piece of us up here <laughs> has encased in it a brain by which we process what? Everything we see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. Interestingly enough, that's how Satan gets us. Through our five what? senses. senses. So the will means, the actual word from the Greek is to determine or to make a choice. And we looked up Romans 12, 1 and 2 and Matthew 26, 39. Time did not permit us to take a look at what I think is a very, very descriptive definition of the will. Let's turn in our Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. When you get there, say ready. And I would like to have someone volunteer to read Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Verse 16. Okay, the first hand I saw was Linda. Would you read that for us? Romans 6, 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave whom you obey, whether of leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Thank you. So, here we have the function of the will. The will is the one that determines to whom we are going to become what? Why does the Apostle Paul use the word slave? Because at that time in history, at least half of the entire Roman Empire was populated by either political slaves or financial slaves. Political being what? The conquest of Rome. They brought a lot of those people back. They became slaves. Financial means what? People that were bought. Bought financial. And they function as slaves. So the Apostle Paul is saying here, do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one that you have chosen to obey? Either of sin, resulting in what? Death. Or of righteousness, Resulting in what? Obedience. Do you know what the word obedience means? Using the will to choose to submit or subordinate every aspect of your life or your will to whom? Christ. To God. That is all that we're capable of doing since Adam and Eve decided to become self-dependent instead of God-dependent. And that's what Paul is saying here. Since Adam and Eve sinned, you only have one choice to make. You can choose to become a slave to Satan, or you may choose to become a slave to God. Yes? Would you like to find out what the rewards are if you choose to become a slave to Christ? Who would like to read verse 22 of the same chapter 6 of Romans? Romans 6, verse 22. May I ask a question? Uh, sure. It has to do with the will. Even that is prompted by the Holy Spirit, correct? <coughs> that choice. Not that we're forced into making that choice, but that the Holy Spirit prompts us so that we make that choice. Is that not correct? 
That is correct. That is very correct. But I want to get into that a little bit more detail later. And if I forget, remind me. Because that is a crucial point. Okay? Who would like to read verse 22 of Romans 6? Right over here, Pat. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end of everlasting life. Thank you. What does holiness mean here? Sanctification. What? Sanctification. Yes. What does the word sanctification mean? Holy living. Huh? Holy living. What did you say? Righteous living. Yes. Righteous living. So if you choose to become a slave to Christ, what does he guarantee? Say it again. Righteous living. Righteous living. Who guarantees it? Christ. Because you have turned your what over to him? Will. Well, you will. You have subordinated your will. That's what the word obey means in the Bible, in the original language, hupakoi. It means to subordinate or submit your will to someone. And that's what Paul is saying here in Romans 6. You can either choose to become a slave to Satan, which leads to eternal death, or you can choose to become a slave to Christ, which leads to eternal, eternal life. life. Eternal life. What a difficult decision to make. <laughs> wow, that's a tough one. Glory was the seventh word, which means to allow God's creative power to reproduce His character in you. And Paul concludes verse 5 by saying what? Amen. Amen. What does amen mean? I agree. So be it. So be it. Believe it. This is the real deal. <clears throat> Any questions of what we've covered so far as the introduction? I encourage you to ask questions that are related to what was said. Galatians chapter 1. This morning, we are going to be looking, or try to look, at Galatians chapter 1, <coughs> verses 6 through 10. Question. Do your Bibles have headings for each chapter and subheadings within the chapter. Yes. Does your Bible have a subheading between verses 5, where we ended last week, and verse 6, where we're beginning this week? Yes. yes. Who would like to read the subheading? Christian liberty. Christian what? Liberty. Liberty? Mine says, only one gospel. Only one gospel. That's the New King James. Yes. Any other? Some we headings. harvest what we plant. What? We harvest what we plant. Good. Kindle translation. A version of the gospel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's pretty strong language, isn't it? Yes. Perversion of the gospel. These subheadings are helpful because they are like paragraphs making a distinct separation between a particular point within a chapter, or in this case, within a letter. So, how many forces are at work on this earth today? How many? Two. 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 In other words, the great controversy is between Christ whom? and Satan. Christ and Satan. That fact will never, ever change. Ever. Everything that I choose to think, say, 
or do is a reaction to one of those two powers calling me. There is no in-between. There is no third power. I'm going to say it again. Everything that I choose to think, say, and do is my direct response to one of those two powers called. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. I need a volunteer to read that for us, please. God is faithful for whom you are called into his fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Who is faithful? God. What does the word fellowship mean? Coming together. Coming together. <coughs> say perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish. The word perfect in the Bible, and it's important for us to understand this because that's another word that is misunderstood and misused. The word perfect means to repair, to mend, or restore something. Can we all agree that all of us need some serious repairing yes. Yes. and amending? And God obviously wants to do all of this to restore us to a relationship with Him where? Starting here. We're never going to experience it up there unless it happens here first. Well, uh, how, how would that happen for us individually? Well, we're going to get into that. Oh, okay. Hang on to that question. All right. Confirm means to set you in the right direction. In the first lesson of this quarter, we studied how God set who in the right direction. The author... Well, the book we're studying. Paul. Yeah. We have Paul, very, very confident. He's got documented, notarized statements from the Supreme Court of his day in Jerusalem 
to go to Damascus and enter all of the synagogues and weed out all of the followers of Jesus. And what else did he have? He brought some muscle with him. Right? What does God do? He blinds him and the muscle that Paul or Saul brought with him at the time he was Saul. So what's the first thing that God does? He gets his attention. So was Saul a little confident that he had those notarized documents from the leaders in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. Now what happens? He's blinded. And Jesus says to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And what is Saul's response? Who are you? Who are you, Lord? Important word, L-O-R-D. The word Lord means someone that is in charge, someone that is in control. I'm not speaking of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Someone that is in control. So the first thing that God does is establish who's in control. He blinds him and the muscle that he brought with him. So he's got his attention. And then what does Jesus say? Isn't it very, very difficult for you to keep kicking against the thorns of a gold bush? What does Saul say? What would you have me do? He spun him around on the spot. What does that mean? What would you have me do? Subordinate later in the song. Yes. He exercises his will. Even though he's got these documents and he's got this muscle with him. <coughs> Instantly. Instantly. Saul is what? Converted. Born, yes. Born again. Paul was already committed. He was just committed to the wrong thing. God had to show him the right thing. <clears throat> so he recommitted his life to the right thing. And he was committed both ways. Good. So the word that we're studying right now is what? Confirmed. He's setting it in the right direction or a new direction. That's what the word confirm means. Do you trust God to set you in the right direction? Yes. It's either that or Satan. Romans 6, 16. There is no other source, no other power at work here. The word strengthen means a spiritual understanding, knowledge and understanding of what? The creative power of God. Again, as I mentioned last week, there's only one reason to be here on Sabbath. And that is to celebrate the creative power of God to create everything in six days. And so he asked Adam and Eve, I want for you to rest the first 24 hours of your life. That's unusual. 